Welcome to lesson three of module three, biological diversity. In this video, we're gonna be looking at adaptations and how they relate to survival. When we look at adaptations, we are actually looking at three different types. So structural, physiological, and behavioral. When we talk about an adaptation, these are any feature that enables the organism to survive and reproduce in different environments. And these have evolved in response to various environmental factors. A characteristic is a feature or quality belonging typically to a person, place or thing and serves to identify them. When we talk about a structural adaptation, we're talking about any anatomical or morphological features that improve an organism's ability to cope with factors in their environment. Physiological adaptations are any internal systematic responses to anything external to the body in order to help an organism to survive. And then finally, behavioral adaptations are any activities that an organism does to help it survive in its natural habitat. When we look at each of these adaptations, we are going to look at them both in plants and in animals. So we're going to start with structural adaptations in plants. And there are many structures which aim to reduce water loss, um, which can in fact be caused by salinity, heat and wind. So some of those are reduced leaf surface area, fewer stomata, the any stomatal hairs that create a human microclimate. We can see sometimes the stomata are sunken or protected. Uh, they have thick waxy cuticles, um, sometimes there are extensive root systems, um, the idea that leaves can roll, uh, leaves orient themselves away from sunlight, and the shedding of leaves are all in fact structural adaptations of plants. And we can see here on the right the example of a cactus, and so it does in fact have seven of those characteristics which are listed to the side there. So when we talk about the structural adaptations that plants have, it does depend on the environment in which they live. So if there are cold, dry environments in which a plant is living, they're going to aim to reduce any water loss by transpiration. So these, in fact, do have reduced surface area, and this usually is achieved by growing their leaves as needles. Um, they may, in fact, be a deciduous tree in which they shed their leaves. This pauses photosynthesis and growth, but it does, in fact, conserve water within the plant or they may have waxy cuticles. There are different adaptations in plants that live in warm and wet environments because they have to cope with high rainfall and also high humidity. So sometimes there is thin bark um, because there is no need to prevent water loss because there's always rainfall. They can have thick waxy leaves and this causes water to run off quickly to prevent fungal growth. They may have a drip tip on the leaves and this, in um, this is in fact where <clears throat> the end of the leaf is pointed, so the water does in fact funnel off the leaf. <coughs> they may have different types of roots, um, which allow them to have stability in shallow soils. Um, and there may also be epiphytes, which are plants that climb above the shady undergrowth. In animals, we have some different structural adaptations. So they may have thick fur and blubber or fat, which insulate them against the cold. Bright feathers um, help attract mates. Large ears increase heat loss. Small ears reduce heat loss. They may have webbed feet or flippers, which are designed for better swimming. They can have spines, which are protection against predators. Some may have a overall body shape and size, which enable them to conserve heat or water. And they may, in fact, have body coverings that are patterned, which allow for them to clam camouflage. Some organisms uh, have a larger surface area to volume ratio, meaning that they can cool down and heat up very quickly. Um, and this is usually found in organisms that live in hot and dry climates. So smaller organisms are more likely to survive in those hot, dry climates. However, um, some large animals, if they have a greater volume relative to its surface area, um, which means that it can conserve body heat. And this is well suited in organisms that live in cold and icy environments. Some organisms may have vascular body parts. So these include um, some of their extremities, which have uh, lots of blood vessels. And this enables uh, organisms to release their body heat to the external environment, which acts as a way of keeping them cool. And then we also see dental adaptations, which are in fact a structure. 
Um, and these enable an organism to meet their dietary requirements based on the different types of teeth that they have. Um, so flattened molars, we know, are, are a way of grinding plant material in herbivores, but also um, some sharp bicuspid molars produce a scissor action for tearing meat in carnivores. When we talk about physiological adaptations, there are some that occur in plants, one of which is CAMP. And this is a type of photosynthesis that aims to reduce water loss. So when we talk about physiological, we're talking about something that's happening internal to the organism. Um, so plants have this CAM process, which um, sea stomata only open at night to collect the carbon dioxide. They then have to store this carbon dioxide in their um, in the plant itself, and it's stored as malic acid. During the day, this malic acid is then transported to the chloroplast where photosynthesis takes place. Um, and it allows that photosynthesis to take part um, take part during the day, but it doesn't actually involve opening the stomata during the day, which would in fact cause water and um, water to be lost through the plant. Some organisms have a physiological adaptation um, which allows them to tolerate frost. So we see this in plants living in cold climates um, and it allows uh, them to stop any crystal ice crystal formation. Um, and this also allows them to en prevent any effect that this temperature change might have on the activity of enzymes. So some ways in which plants do this, they can accumulate high concentrations of solutes. So these include things like sugar and salt, which in fact lowers the freezing point of water. However, some plants produce an antifreeze protein, which inhibits the growth of ice crystals um, by binding to them to prevent these from uh, joining together. Some other adaptations is uh, they have mechanisms internally, which allow them to exclude or um, regulate their concentration of salt in their tissues. And this is really important for plants that are in high salt environments. So sometimes they can shed their leaves, um, which are overloaded with salt. They can excrete salt from their salt glands. They can pump salt out through their roots. And sometimes they increase their water uptake to dilute the salt concentration. Mangroves um, are one example of organisms which experience the fluctuating salinity levels. They also experience a lack of oxygen from waterlogged soil, and sometimes they have unstable soil, and um, which affects their seed dispersal. So they do have mechanisms um, to exclude, excrete, and accumulate salt. Uh, they have aerial roots, which increases the surface area exposed to the air at low tide, which enables them to uh, increase their oxygen uptake at those times. And their seeds are buoyant and viviparous, um, which enable them to germinate while attached to the parrot. Within animals, um, some physiological adaptations include producing concentrated urine to conserve water, uh, producing venom for prey capture or defense. Uh, they may change color in response to sunlight to aid in thermoregulation. Um, and another one is shivering to maintain body temperature when cold. So to camouflage, they organisms have specialized color changing cells called chromatophores, and these enable the organism to change color. They also may have a physiological um, mechanism to move pigment um, to and from cells, which change their reflective characteristics. They do have mechanisms to um, cool their body. And this evaporating cooling process um, is achieved by the warm sweat coming into contact with cool air, allowing that sweat to evaporate. By carrying the heat away, it lowers the body temperature. We also see a heat exchange process taking place for both cooling and for heating. Um, and so there are there is a system of networks of veins um, and arteries that enable the heat to be lost from blood before it enters the brain. Um, and this is really important for a cooling effect to make sure the brain doesn't overheat. However, if they do require um, heating, there is a counter current flow uh, which can help to reduce heat loss and maintain body temperature, um, which can happen um, sometimes in tails, flippers, or foot. Uh, to enable organisms to dive deeply in water, some mammals can store oxygen um, really efficiently due to their increased hemoglobin, 
Um, and sometimes they can also perform anaerobic respiration um, because they have a high tolerance for lactic acid. And then the last one here is bioluminescence. And this enables light to be produced by an organism, um, which can attract attention to themselves, but also frighten their enemies or lure their prey. Um, so it's the re release of light following a chemical reaction. And sometimes um, some organisms play host to bioluminescent bacteria. And one of the, another physiological adaptation, we mentioned it previously, is torpor, which is um, a type of dormancy, which is where the metabolic rate of an organism is lowered to save energy. Um, so it enables an organism to cope with environmental stresses, such as extreme heat or cold, um, and when there's a decreased availability of food and nutrients. So three examples of torpor is hibernation, brumation, and astivation. So you may have heard of hibernation, and it's the prolonged torpor during winter. So they, organisms do, in fact, decrease their body temperature and heart rate to conserve energy. And then we see the other examples here. So there are some behavioural adaptations, um, and in plants we do in fact call these movement adaptations. Um, so there are mechanisms for plants to move um, themselves in response to light, and that is um, to light, which is phototropism. But tropism is the word in which we use um, to describe any response that a plant has to an environmental fa factor. And this movement of the plant is in fact controlled by hormones and turgor pressure. So there's phototropism, which is a response to light. Um, and we see uh, in the left here that there's a picture here where depending on the angle of the light will depend on where the plant grows towards. And then we see the other types of tropism listed below there too. There is nastic movement, which is the movement of plant tissue in response to environmental stimulus. Um, but it doesn't necessarily move in the direction of that stimulus. So we see thigmonasty, which is response to touch, and that's the mechanism we see used from the Venus flytrap. There's photonasty in response to light, and there's thermonasty, which is response to changes in temperature. So there are some behavioural adaptations in animals. So they may seek um, or leave shade or shelter in order to change their body temperature. Um, evaporating cooling, which we looked at before, to lower the temperature. So this includes things like panting or licking their limbs, spraying water on their own body, um, gaping their mouth. Birds can, in fact, flap the membranes in their throat, which we call gula flattering. Um, and some organisms actually urinate on their legs to create evaporating cooling. Huddling aims to help organisms cope with cold temperatures, um, and it decreases the surface area of the group, which is exposed to the harsh environment. And we see migration, the seasonal pattern of relocation to seek better food availability, um, sometimes for better breeding, but also just for more suitable climatic conditions. And this is in fact prompted by environmental cues. So they notice the length of the day has changed. Thank you for watching lesson three. Make sure you tune in for lesson four.